Science vs. Propaganda is a podcast at the intersection between science communication and social justice activism, challenging pseudoscience, bad science, and the misrepresentation of science by those championing reactionary agendas. In this episode, I respond to the news that a team of researchers from the lab of a man who has spent most of his career denying that bisexual men exist has, supposedly, just discovered that bisexual men do exist. I'll be diving deep into the swamp of alternative sexology, so you don't have to. We'll learn precisely how dim-witted the supposed evidence against male bisexuality truly was, and we'll also learn how deeply connected this silliness is to the lingering transphobic pseudoscience called Blanchard's typology. That is, we'll find out why some people felt the need to defend such a ridiculous hypothesis in the first place. I cut a bit out of the last episode about James Cantor, the guy behind the blog post that compiled all the papers from conversion therapists and misrepresented them. Specifically, it was a bit about how he also denied that bisexual men exist, influenced by his friend Michael Bailey, and how this connected to the broader theme of anti-transgender pseudoscience. I cut this section because it was going off on a tangent. The episode was already quite long, and the only way to do it justice was to go into even more detail. I resigned to leave it to a future episode. To do the puberty blocker episode first, and then maybe the big one about genetic determinism I've been planning, before perhaps returning to it. Rather annoyingly, a couple of weeks later, this particular obscure brand of stupidity hit the headlines after Bailey and his collaborators published a paper appearing to recant their views. Tabloid papers led with somewhat bemused headlines simultaneously announcing both that scientists had discovered that bisexual men exist, and that apparently some scientists had, until now, doubted bisexual men exist. While articles in the queer press tended to express surprise that the crank sexologist better known for his anti-trans views was also a bisexuality denier. But this isn't really a question of also. It's a question of hence. The pseudoscientific bisexual erasure of Bailey and Cantor is not a quirk that happens to coexist with their ideas about trans people. It was a conceit that needed to exist in order to defend their views on trans people, the conceit upon which their whole pseudoscientific theory rests. Let's take a closer look. Back in 2005, the authors recruited 101 men and assessed their sexual orientation by self-report using the Kinsey Sexual Attraction Scale and assigned them to one of three categories, heterosexual, bisexual or homosexual, based on their Kinsey score. They then had their penises wired up to a device that measures variation in girth, and then measured their response to neutral stimuli and to short pornographic films. Two of the porn clips depicted two men having sex with each other, and the remaining two clips depicted two women having sex with each other. Participants were also asked to measure their subjective arousal by moving a lever up and down. The authors then present a hypothesis, that bisexual men tend to have bisexual arousal patterns, which they define as a negative quadratic relationship between the Kinsey score and physiological arousal in response to the least arousing sex. Yeah. That is, for every participant, they calculated an average response to the male-male porn and an average response to the female-female porn and use whichever is lower, Plot this on the y-axis against Kinsey's score on the x-axis and test for a quadratic relationship. Why do we do this? I don't know. Nowhere in the paper is this choice explained. The result of this seemingly arbitrary test is negative, and they then show that when an equally arbitrary test for homosexual arousal patterns is applied to the bisexual group, that result is positive. They then conclude that there's no evidence bisexual men exist and that those in their bisexual group are mostly gay men, with a few straight men mixed in, who identify as bi for non-sexual reasons. They do this in spite of two key facts. First, the subjective arousal measure of the bisexual men actually did fit their quadratic model, whatever the relevance of that is supposed to be. And second, every man in that group showed more arousal to both types of porn than they did to neutral stimuli, 
That is, they were aroused by both the male on male porn and the female on female porn. Now, this has some serious problems that go beyond their unexplained model. Clearly, the authors are working from the assumption that physiological response of changing penile girth is a more reliable measure of true arousal than self-reporting by the participants. How do they justify this? They cite a previous study which showed a strong correlation between the physiological and subjective measures of arousal. This result was demonstrated for both straight and gay men, but no bisexual group was present. Bailey and co. take this as establishing that their physiological measure is valid, and that the poor correlation in their bisexual group must be because the bisexual men's self-reports are false, rather than their physiological measure being invalid. You may also be wondering about their choice in porn. Why compare male-male couplings and female-female couplings, while ignoring male-female couplings? One could easily imagine a scenario in which there is a large gap between the degree of arousal for female-female pairings and male-female pairings, for example. What would the implication be for sexual orientation then? We live in a society in which sexual activity between women is highly fetishized, and in which many straight men prefer that kind of pornography over alternatives. Might it be that those men in the bisexual category, who the authors claim show heterosexual arousal patterns, may be equally aroused by male-female pairings as by male-male pairings, but be even more turned on by the female-female pairings for this reason? The choice to exclude male-female pairings is justified by reference to the same study as mentioned earlier, which found a sharper difference in degree of arousal between gay and straight men when shown female-female pairings than when shown mixed pairings, concluding that what it calls lesbian and male homosexual films are best able to discriminate between heterosexual and homosexual patterns of arousal. In effect, what Bailey and his co-authors have done is taken data showing that self-identified bisexual men are aroused by both man-on-man -man porn and woman-on-woman -woman porn, applied a test designed to distinguish between straight and gay men from a study that did not consider any bisexual men, and used this to assign each of their bisexual men to one category or the other, and call them liars. There's also the problem of the small number of stimuli videos employed. What about confounding variables? What if Bailey's got better taste in one genre of porn than the other? What if arousal is impacted more by the sex act depicted than the genders of the performers? Sex acts that may be niche in female-on-female -female porn clips, but mainstays of male-on-male. -male. Here our intrepid authors appear to have ignored a warning from the older study they're using as a crutch, in which it was reported that the strength of correlation between subjective and physiological stimuli was lower among gay men than for straight men, replicating a result found in previous studies, but in which it was also determined that this was a confound of the stimulus content. More specifically, when variables such as partner preference and level of arousal were accounted for, there was no longer any significant difference in correlation between the groups. The apparently poor correlation between subjective and physiological arousal in gay men was an artifact of a generally lower level of arousal due to the quality of the stimulus. Given that only two videos were shown for each category in Bailey's study, there's every reason to think a similar problem may be causing the poor correlation he's found among bisexual men. Finally, the problem can be found in how they define their sexual identity categories. I mentioned earlier that the participants were assigned to heterosexual, bisexual or homosexual groups based on Kinsey's score. What I did not mention is is that the heterosexual group was defined by a Kinsey score of 0 or 1, and the homosexual group as 5 or 6, with the bisexual group as 2, 3 or 4. This despite the fact that, by definition, people at Kinsey 1 and 5 show attraction to both men and women, albeit with a clear preference for one over the other. Keep in mind that their whole argument is that a difficulty distinguishing the arousal patterns of men in the bisexual group from those in other groups is a result of the bisexual group actually being composed mostly of gay men with a few straights mixed in. But in reality the opposite is the case. Both the heterosexual group and the homosexual group contain large numbers of bi men, 
possibly even a majority of them, the precise breakdown isn't provided. In this light, there's simply no reason to expect there would be a clear difference between the bisexual group and either of its neighbours. The recently published paper, whose lead author, Jeremy Jabor, is a PhD student in Bailey's department, is a meta-analysis of the physiological arousal data that's been published over the years, and it concludes, unsurprisingly, that Bailey's original conclusion was incorrect. Jabor himself is quoted in Undark to the effect of expressing his scepticism of the assumption that measuring physiological stimuli can invalidate self-reported sexual orientation. A battle with unnamed co-authors he claims to have lost when drafting the paper. One rather gets the impression that the poor guy felt held hostage. Now, if this were the whole story, I would still be covering it. Bad science? Check. Aimed at propping up a reactionary agenda or targeted at a marginalised group? Check. Weird penis research? Check. It's got everything that we love here at Science vs. Propaganda. But this isn't the whole story. As I hinted at the beginning, this turns out to be a very small part of a much wider reactionary and pseudoscientific agenda. And for the second half of this episode, that's what I want to take a look at. The second most infamous controversy on the record of Northwestern University Professor J. Michael Bailey is an incident from 2011 in which he arranged for a live sex act to be performed in a lecture in front of his undergraduate students. I tell you this not to demonstrate how little faith we should place in this man's professional judgement, although it certainly accomplishes that task. Rather, I tell you this because when I say that the most infamous controversy on his record is the one surrounding the publication of his 2003 book, The Man Who Would Be Queen, I want you to understand my full meaning. The book is offensive both for the theory for which it argues, and for the manner in which that argument is made. The theory is as demeaning as it is absurd, while the argument is as absurd as it is demeaning. Bailey opens by telling the reader about the time a female friend of his told him that the best cosmetic salesperson at a local department store is a man, and that he apparently found the idea of a man working as a cosmetic salesman so remarkable that it required further investigation. We are two sentences into this book. Rest assured he rushed out to meet Edwin, a young man he describes as tall and African American, with a shaved head and wearing clear nail polish. Now, let me read you the entire second paragraph. Knowing his occupation, and observing him briefly and superficially, were sufficient, together, for me to guess confidently about aspects of Edwin's life that he had never mentioned. I knew what he was like as a little boy. I know what kind of person he is sexually attracted to. I know what kind of activities interest him and what kinds do not. I am least sure what he will look like five years' time from now. Based on his current appearance, there is a chance he will undergo a dramatic change. The dramatic change Bailey refers to, of course, is gender transition. While Bailey at least has sufficient epistemic modesty to admit that he isn't sure that Edwin will transition, he is rather more confident, based on observations he himself describes as brief and superficial, that Edwin is gay. He tells us, although I did not ask him, I know that Edwin likes to have sex with men. Not all gay men are like Edwin, but almost all men like Edwin are gay. And, I did not ask Edwin about his childhood, because I did not need to. I already know that Edwin played with dolls and loathed football, and that his best friends were girls. I know that he was often teased by other boys, who called him sissy. He begins paragraph three with his sentence, Although I am virtually certain that my conclusions are correct, they fly in the face of mainstream academic opinion. These are not sentences that any serious scientist should write. Certainty is not a virtue in a scientist, and certainty in opposition to the scientific consensus is the creed of cranks and charlatans and the self-appointed heirs to Galileo. When challenging the majority of experts, a sceptically-minded person ought to possess at least a little self-doubt. The opening of the book sets the tone for what is to come, as Bailey spends the next 200 pages leaping from superficial observation to wild conclusion, based on little more than appeals to popular prejudice and familiar 90s stereotypes. 
It's a book which is not just wrong, but silly, and it reflects poorly on the judgement of anyone who takes it seriously. When I first decided to read this book two years ago, I went into it expecting the bad science. I went into it expecting it to be needlessly offensive. I just wasn't expecting it to be quite this dumb. But what's the point of all this? Bailey concludes the preface by railing against attempts to separate sexuality and gender. He tells us that Edwin would receive little romantic attention in a gay bar because he is too feminine. He concludes by telling us, Edwin is near the boundary of male and female, and someday he may cross it. If he does, one primary motive will be lust. Transsexuals lead to remarkable sex lives. Those who love men become women to attract them. Those who love women become the women they love. Here Bailey tells us what he's really getting at. Gay men who are super femme transition to become women as a way to get straight men to have sex with them, because other gay men are only into butch gay men. Even though a quick reference to the popularity of various categories on Pornhub should cast some doubt on this claim. Those who don't fit this explanation, owing to being attracted to women and not men, are transitioning in order to fulfil a narcissistic sexual fetish. If you are wondering how bisexuals fit into this binary, then congratulations. You've already spotted the link between Bailey's bisexual erasure pseudoscience and his transgender pseudoscience. After the preface, the book goes through as many salacious anecdotes as Bailey can type with only one hand, all aimed at justifying this binary typology, a typology that originates with his fellow heterodox sexologist Ray Blanchard. If you listened to the previous episode, you will likely recall that back in the 70s and 80s, Clinical researchers rarely drew a sharp distinction between being gay and being trans, with effeminacy in boyhood being seen as a predictor of both. In one of the dominant approaches, trans women were generally assumed to just be really gay men, or at least affected by a similar condition. But by the late 80s, this position was increasingly untenable. Growing visibility and public awareness and acceptance of the LGBT community, the rise of gay, bisexual and trans people able to speak in their own voices, and an accumulation of data from those seeking medical or surgical transition, meant these researchers could no longer ignore the obvious fact that not all trans women were exclusively attracted to men, and many are exclusively attracted to women. Would they have to listen to what trans people were telling them? that this was a question of gender identity rather than sexuality? Some started to, and over time this view would eventually gain mainstream acceptance, but in the meantime the holdouts needed some straws to grasp onto. They needed a way to bodge their homosexuality theory so as to somehow accommodate people with the opposite sexual orientation, and it was Blanchard who came up with the bodge that caught on. He called it autogynophilia. For Blanchard, trans women could be divided into two categories, so-called homosexual transsexuals, to whom the classical model applied, and so-called autogynophilic transsexuals, heterosexual men who were in love with the idea of themselves as women. The former category transitioned out of sexual strategy, as earlier described by Bailey, or out of a desire for social acceptance of their natural femininity. The latter transitioned out of a fetishistic desire to become the woman who was the object of their sexual attraction. Two main pieces of evidence were forwarded in defence of this typology. Firstly, Blanchard claims that when sexual orientation is, is plotted against the age at which a participant reports first showing gender nonconforming interests, there are two distinct clusters with trans women attracted exclusively to men showing such interests in early childhood and other trans women developing them post-adolescence or even into adulthood. Secondly, it is claimed that when what are described as autogynophilic interests are plotted against sexual orientation, we again find two clusters, with trans women who are exclusively attracted to men, apparently engaging in activities like erotic cross-dressing much less often, while this practice is supposedly ubiquitous among other trans women. Now, None of this is actually true, and Blanchard was only able to get his two neat clusters by finding ways to ignore data points who don't fit, 
One of the ways he did this was to use the same ridiculous penis polygraph as Bailey in order to prove that trans lesbians who claim they are not turned on by dressing as women actually get aroused when played erotic cross-dressing audio narratives. As little effort is made to establish the validity of using differential penoscope as a measure of autogynephilia, as was made to validate it as a measure of sexual orientation in Bailey's study. Ultimately, this proved so unsuccessful that Blanchard abandoned the attempt to fit all so-called autogynephilic trans women into the single cluster altogether, and instead started claiming that autogynephilic sexual fantasy manifested in four distinct forms, behavioural, transvestic, physiological and anatomic autogynephilia. A further complication emerged in response to the objection that the process of taking cross-sex hormones is often associated with a loss of libido. Why then do the vast majority of trans women persist with medical transition if this is just a kink? Blanchard answered this by declaring that autogynephilia was now no longer just a paraphilia, but also a new sexual orientation characterised by a man forming a heterosexual pair bond with the idea of himself as a woman, a relationship which can persist even in the temporary absence of sexual interest. Even though the claims I deal with on this show are frequently ridiculous, I try not to resort to appeals to ridicule. But, come on, who's buying any of this? Anyway, for our purpose, the more interesting complication, as previously hinted, is the question of bisexuality. Where do they fit in to the binary? They don't. And that's where the bisexual erasure comes in. For Blanchard, Bailey and Cantor, male bisexuality, of which they regard trans-female bisexuality to be a subcategory, is always pseudo-bisexuality. If a trans woman is attracted to other women, but claims to be bi, it's not because she's genuinely also sexually attracted to men, it's because the presence of a man in her sexual fantasy helps to validate her autogynephilic fantasy. Likewise, if a cis man is attracted to a woman, and claims that they are bi, then they are actually gynandromorphophiles. That is, men who are attracted specifically to trans women with intact penises, rather than being attracted to both men and women. And if you think I must be summarising their position uncharitably here, I'll link to a clip from a YouTube interview in which James Cantor sets out precisely this view, although trans women is not the uh, term he uses. Yikes. And it just goes on like this. Blanchard's theory hangs from a chain of potentially endless ad hoc hypotheses. There is no possible contrary evidence which cannot be explained away by inventing a new subcategory. The theory is as unfalsifiable as it is unparsimonious. This is why Blanchard and his allies need so many distinct etiologies to explain what appears to be at face value a single phenomenon having a different gender identity to the one assigned at birth. The pattern continues with the recent embrace by the same clique of the rapid onset gender dysphoria myth discussed in the previous episode. Perhaps the lesson that should be taken away from all this is to be wary of data that fails the sniff test. It's all too easy to get carried away and assume that hard data, measurements spread out on a computer after strapping an electronic device to somebody's body, or putting their head in an MRI machine, don't lie. That they are more objective, more valid, and ultimately just more scientific than qualitative or ethnographic research. Yet what we've seen here is that such approaches aren't necessarily better. We've seen how appeals to hard, quantitative data can lead us down a blind alley, how they can lead us to less accurate results than if we just asked. I didn't need to read Bailey's paper to tell you that his conclusion was bullshit. I did, because that's what I do here. But I didn't have to. There's no laboratory test or quadratic model that could tell me that I'm wrong about who I'm attracted to. That's all folks, thanks for listening. Be sure to like, comment and subscribe, and all those things the algorithm likes. And special thanks to my $5 plus patrons, Philippe Guzman, Joe Boyle, James Lingford, Julie, Calais Lepala, Lannery Joseph, and Ryan.
If you'd like to support more content like this, please go to patreon.com slash science versus propaganda. That's science vs propaganda. See you next time.